We need to remember in these handful of chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, starting with chapter 21, that we are in this Passion Week, the week of Christ between the day that he enters the city of Jerusalem and we're making our way to the cross and to the empty tomb. So every story that we tell, every conversation that we read fits inside of this narrative of Jesus on his way to the cross. And so in our passage of Scripture today, as Jesus gets closer to the cross, we're further into the week. The opposition to him grows more profound and is actually coming now from deeper within the halls of religious power. In our passage of Scripture today, Jesus is in the temple teaching again, and he's going to be approached by what Matthew calls the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, what that means is that you and I can now add to the list of Jesus' enemies a group of men called the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin is made up of 70 individuals, and these men represent the pinnacle of religious power and religious culture in Jesus' day and age. If there's a group of individuals who have the leverage to get Jesus crucified, it's going to be these men, the men of the Sanhedrin. And they now are openly opposing Jesus when he teaches inside of the temple. In our passage of Scripture today, specifically what they want to know is what Christ's credentials are like. They just ask him the question, who gave you the authority to do all these things that you're doing? Well, clearly these men did not give him the authority that they thought that he should have received from them. And as a matter of fact, these men are going to do absolutely everything that they know how to do in order to stop Jesus. So in our passage today, the first thing that happens is that Jesus catches them inside of their own trap, and then he tells them two parables. Our uh, reading today consists of three movements, a conversation and then two parables. So here's what happens in those three things. First of all, we begin and we end by learning about Christ's authority. It's an important word to this passage of Scripture. It's an important word for you and me today as we sort of wrestle with what Jesus has to say. Christ's authority. Who gave it to him? Where does it come from? What, who, who, who does he have authority over? And then an interesting question about his authority that will be answered by the time that we're done. How long does the authority of Jesus Christ last? It's important for us to wrestle with this notion of the authority of Jesus Christ for a lot of reasons. But one of them is this. You and I live in a culture that values our autonomy. We value a certain degree of social flatness, of a lack of hierarchy. We value autonomy. We value moral and religious relativism, which means that by and large, we struggle, our culture especially struggles, with any notion of authority, much less the idea of absolute and complete authority over me. As a culture, we respond really well to phrases like, who are you to tell me to? We respond really well to very expensive advertising campaigns that say you must express your individuality by buying this product that 2.5 billion people have bought, and that way you can be unique like everybody else, right? We respond well to this as a culture. But here we come face to face with a conversation about the authority that Jesus has. And in the end, the kind of authority that Jesus has over Phil's life. That's where we begin and that's where we end. And in between those two things, in between those two passages on authority, we're going to learn about obedience and repentance. Now, if you were going to give a pastor three words to speak on that would immediately turn off a congregation, you could begin with authority, repentance, and obedience. But here's what happens at Living Hope. The Word of God tells us what to talk about. So here we are. And we're going to talk about authority, repentance, and obedience. Not only do we need to learn to do the will of God, this is still in the context of even fruitfulness, that's been a big deal in chapter 21. Not only do we need to learn to do the will of God, we discover that our lives are changed for the better when we do. Let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 23. And when he entered the temple... The chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, 
By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will also ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come, from heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then you did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So here we are again. Jesus has walked into the temple and he is teaching the people. Jesus, the triumphal entry was probably on Sunday. So this is probably Tuesday inside of this week on our way to the cross. But Jesus enters the temple again and he's teaching the people. As Luke tells this story in Luke chapter 20, he just straight up says Jesus is preaching the gospel to the people that he's talking to inside of the temple. And while Jesus is teaching, the chief priests, the elders of the people, they interrupt and they ask him this question. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Now, in their world, becoming a teacher of the law, becoming a rabbi, becoming a scribe, that's a regulated industry. There's a pathway to get there. There's a certain form of education that you take, and not everybody who starts that pathway ends that pathway. And people like the Sanhedrin had not only gone through that process, they're part of the system that oversees that process. You need a certification, a piece of paper. I actually have in my wallet a little card from the Assemblies of God that says I have a license to preach. James Bond has a license to kill. I have a license to preach, right? They don't make movies about people like me. <laughs> and as long as I stay in good standing and my doctrine remains upright and on and on, the case goes, every year they send me that little card that says, we have recognized the call that God has placed upon your life and they're part of the authority structure over me and I receive a certain degree of authority to do what I do from them and in relationship with them. And the Sanhedrin, this is part of what they're asking. Who gave you this authority to do all of this teaching, to do these things. That's an interesting phrase on Tuesday, given the last couple of days that we've read about in chapter 21. What do they mean by these things? Well, in a city that's packed to overcrowded with maybe over a million people who have come in to make their sacrifices for the Passover, Jesus has already made some waves on his way into Jerusalem. So far, Jesus has made a commotion through the triumphal entry. A crowd of people have actually hailed him as the son of David, the coming Messiah, their king, as he's made his way into Jerusalem there in a couple of passages ago. Jesus, the other day, he put together a cord of whips and he turned over tables and he drove out the money changers in the temple. And he's trying to cleanse the temple for worship and prayer. Jesus, in that same day, he heals people on the temple grounds who technically were not allowed in the temple on the first, in the first place. So who's giving you the authority to do these things? What things? Those things. Those are some pretty dramatic and powerful things that have happened. The Sanhedrin certainly desire to silence Jesus. They don't like his message. The Pharisees, uh, others, for a very long time now, have been trying to out-argue Jesus. They've been trying to silence him. We learned a long time ago, in fact, now that they're trying to destroy him. And certainly trying to silence him, but they are in this passage specifically concerned with this point of authority. Who gave you this authority and where did it come from? It's actually a very good question to ask. Authority, how does it work? What is it like? Especially when it comes to spiritual things our souls, our walks with Christ. Who has authority to speak into that? What is the authority of Jesus Christ really like when it comes to my relationship with him, when it comes to what he does inside of our lives? Who has this kind of authority? Where does it actually come from? Who has the capital A authority to give that authority to someone like Jesus? And then you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to, we have to wrestle with something like this. What does it mean for Christians to follow Jesus Christ as their final and absolute 
authority. If he is my Lord, he is my Lord in every piece, every corner, every aspect of my life. So what does it mean for him to be my final and absolute authority? So this is actually a really good question. And here's what Jesus does with the question. We've grown accustomed to this with Jesus, right? A conversation gets started and he turns it right around and goes the other direction. Jesus answered them, well, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you what, by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, he's referring to John the Baptist, that marvelous character in the first few chapters of Matthew's gospel. The baptism of John, from where did it come, from heaven or from men? So Jesus poses a dilemma to the chief priests and the elders of the people. The baptism of John the Baptist, who gave him that authority? Where did that authority come from? And he gives them the two possible answers that they can have to this question. It either comes from heaven, from God, or it comes from human beings. Which do you say, right? So he answers the question with a question. He gives them these options to choose from, and both of them, for these guys, are bad options to pick from. It's actually a very common rabbinical teaching method to answer a question with a question. It's the old joke that people like to tell sometimes. A rabbi is approached by his student one day, and the student says, Rabbi, why do you always answer questions with questions? The rabbi looks at the student, thinks for a second, and goes, well, why wouldn't I, right? <laughs> anyway, I won't tell you who told me that joke if you think it was a bad joke. I take responsibility for it. John the Baptist, where did his authority come from? The correct answer that we know, that Jesus knows, that probably the Sanhedrin know as well, the correct, the correct answer is from heaven. And the point of Jesus asking the question this way is that he's taken their question and he's re-asked the same question in a different context so that we can come to the right answer about the first question. You see? So we re-ask the question, and the answer is from heaven. And you see, the answer to his question is the same answer to the question of the Sanhedrin. The authority that Jesus has received has come straight from his heavenly Father. It's divine authority. But they don't want to accept that. They don't want to listen to that. They want to, don't want to follow that. So Jesus is pressing it with his question. So the Sanhedrin know that they are stuck when Jesus gives them this dilemma. His authority was divine as one of their two options. But they know that, well, if we say that John the Baptist's authority came from heaven, we didn't pay any attention to John the Baptist. So that's what he's going to say. Well, then why didn't you pay attention to what God told him? That means you've rejected God's authority. So they say, well, we can't answer that. Well, if we say if it came from men, all the people around us believe that John the Baptist was a prophet, they're going to turn on us, and we need them on our side against Jesus, so we can't say either one of these things. So they give an answer that they've probably never given anybody before, and it's a cop-out answer. I don't know. <laughs> and I love this moment. Jesus says, so then the conversation's over. Jesus then refuses to move any further inside of the conversation with them with this question. I want to I stop here for just a moment so that we can think about how this conversation works. Because I think this is important. Jesus is a thinker. Jesus, in this sense, is a philosopher. He has out-argued the Pharisees for chapters. He's out-argued the religious leaders of the day in this passage in a matter of three or four or five sentences. Dallas Willard, the writer and philosopher, often says that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived. And that's an interesting phrase because we usually don't put it in those kinds of terms. We think of Jesus using other kinds of terms and ideas. But think about it like this. If you think someone else has ever been smarter than Jesus, then you've got some explaining to do. And maybe there's someone else that you should be following with your life. Jesus, the smartest man who ever lived. So he out-argues his opponents. In these terms, it's what's, be, it's what's called being impaled on the horns of a dilemma. Let me ask you a question. There's two possible answers, and they couldn't take either one of them, so they lost the argument. Not only does he out-argue his opponents, he reveals their falsehoods to everyone else around who is listening. 
He reveals what is their cruel and evil intention. They didn't ask this question because they honestly want to know if they want to follow Jesus. They've asked this question because they're trying to build a case against him to kill him. So he reveals their cruel intentions in this very brief little conversation. And guys, I think this is important for a lot of reasons, and one of them is this. When it comes to bad ideas and destructive falsehoods, and friends, our culture is rife with bad ideas and destructive falsehoods, they need to be dealt with with by thoughtful Christians. They have to be dealt with. They can't just be left out there, and we can't act as if those things aren't bad ideas or destructive. But as God gives us the ability and the wherewithal and even sometimes the courage to do it, we actually have to engage those things and take it from someone who's done this off and on for decades now. It's sometimes hard to do. It sometimes means you're poking the bear and the bear is going to wake up and you don't know if you want to deal with that or not. And yet I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I have to do it. Sometimes we have to do this. We have to oppose bad ideas and destructive falsehoods. The Sanhedrin, the people who are the immediate circle of this conversation, the Sanhedrin in this conversation, they're not convinced, but that's not necessarily who Jesus is talking to. Jesus is also talking to everyone else who's crowded around him, who's listening in on the conversation. And so they get to hear this situation dealt with. They get to hear bad ideas exposed. They get to hear the cruel intentions of the Sanhedrin exposed. So they may not be convinced. Now, now, there is one member of the Sanhedrin who is convinced. His name is Nicodemus. And that's the story of John chapter 3. But what about everyone else who's listening in, who gets to hear the truth talked about by Jesus Christ, or gets to hear the truth talked about and defended by followers of Jesus Christ? So there's more here at stake than just Jesus and the Sanhedrin. There's everyone else who's listening in. But the Sanhedrin refused to give him a straight answer to the question, and Jesus knows why, because it means the answer to their question is that Jesus' authority comes from heaven. So Jesus moves on, and he moves on by telling two parables. I want to read these two parables and deal with them in the context of this conversation so now we're in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, meaning the chief priests and the elders of the people. They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is a curious parable. It's a little enigmatic. And as I was a young man growing up and reading through this parable, sometimes it was a little frustrating to try to figure out what's going on. The story itself is pretty straightforward. It's, it's a pretty quick parable. The father asks two of his sons to go out and work in the field. The first son says no. Later on, changes his mind and goes and works in the field. The second son says, yes, I'll go work in the field, and never actually goes and works in the field. Figuring out this parable means figuring out what's the critical question. What's the middle of the teeter-totter here? How does, what, what does everything in here hinge on? And the critical question is this. Which one of them did the will of his father? Who, in the end, obeyed his father's authority? Now, here's what's interesting and a little condemning, actually. The Sanhedrin get the answer right. Even though the first son originally said no, in the end he did what his father asked. We may, we may not be happy as we read through the parable but the, that the first son told his father, no, I'm not going to do what you told me to do. But remember the critical point of the parable. Who in the end did what his father told him to do? 
The point is the change of mind. In my translation, that phrase, change of mind, happens twice in this short little story. The first son changed his mind and went and did it. And then later on, Jesus turns to the Sanhedrin and he says, when you heard the teaching of John and saw the lives that were changed, why didn't you change your mind and believe him? That little phrase in the English, change of mind, is one of the Greek words in the New Testament that's used for repent. In fact, the King James Bible maintains that language and says the first son repented and went and worked in the field. When you heard the teaching of John and saw how lives changed, why didn't you repent and believe him in the things that he taught? This is about repentance. So Jesus says, after they get the answer right, well, the first son did what his father asked him to do. Jesus turns to them, truly I say to you, this is an interesting thing for Jesus to say to the religious leaders of the day. Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Let this sink in for a second. Jesus tells the religious leaders of the day that some of the most looked down on people in their culture will get to God faster than they will. Not as sinners, but as people who heard the voice of divine authority, heard the teaching of even just John the Baptist and changed their mind, they repented and they believed the message that John taught. They believed the message about Jesus Christ. He tells the religious leaders of the day, the most looked down on people, the people you guys look down on the most, will get to God faster because they've repented. They believed the message of Jesus Christ. Tax collectors and prostitutes, that's who they are in that culture, especially the tax collectors who are treated as traitors. They're Jewish people who are taking money from their Jewish brothers and sisters and giving it to their Roman oppressors. These are people to be looked down upon in their eyes. And Jesus says, they in the end did what their heavenly Father asked them to do. They repented. They changed their mind. They originally said no to God, but in repentance, ended up doing what their Heavenly Father's will was. Notice, here it is, repentance and obedience. These religious leaders say yes all day long and never do what God has asked them to do. That's powerful stuff. Jesus says, for John came to you in divine authority. This group of people listened to him, and they believed. And when you saw those people's lives change, when you saw them turn and believe in the message that John preached, you yourself refused to repent and believe. See, when John came, the point is that one whose authority came from heaven showed up they refused to listen to him. John came with the divine authority that changes lives. And there's a few points I think we need to pull out of this conversation as we're thinking about authority and repentance and obedience. The first is this. Christ is looking for repentance and obedience, not lip service. He's looking for changes of mind. He's looking for a change of life and obedience to do the will of their heavenly Father. He's looking for, you may remember earlier in chapter 21, trees that actually produce fruit. Not trees that look like they produce fruit, but have none. He pulls the leaves back. And he wants to grab a piece of fruit, right? He's looking for trees that produce fruit, not just leaves. We are learning that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and He is my Lord. The magnificent preacher D. James Kennedy used to say this a lot. He said, there's only one thing you never say to your Lord, no. The second you say no to him, he's no longer your Lord. Christ is my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He's my friend. He's my Lord. All authority belongs to him in this life. And then notice this. I love this, friends. This is something to rejoice about. Minds and lives really can change. 
tax collectors and prostitutes and everything that came with their lifestyle changed because of the message of Jesus Christ. Where we start is not where we need to end up. Jesus takes anyone, anyone, and breathes life to anyone who follows him. Genuine relationship with God is not a matter of lip service. Remember, the religious leaders say yes all day long. It's not a matter of lip service. But it's a matter of repentance and obedience in this brand new life. You see, we, we encounter the authority of God to change our lives through repentance and obedience. This is how we come in contact with the power that's in the authority that Christ has. So minds and lives really can change because of Jesus Christ. And then notice this. I love this. Changed lives are a witness to the divine authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you saw it, Jesus says, you refused to follow suit. You refused to change your mind and believe. Changed lives are a witness to the divine authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the most... Uh, Dynamic passages that, that sort of explains this as an example of this comes when the Apostle Paul is writing to this young pastor named Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. There's a lot here. I'm going to read just a couple of verses, though. Paul says, The saying is trustworthy, and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I was one of the most looked down on in that sense. But I received the mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, to the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he's just started the book. <laughs> God did this to me. In order that the patience and the glory and the power of God may be revealed in me so that others will see me and find eternal life in Jesus Christ. See, a changed life is a witness to the divine authority of the gospel. So as we are talking about the kind of authority that God has over all things that Christ has inside of our lives, we're not talking about arbitrary authority. This is not just given because no one else was in line to receive it. This is not arbitrary. It doesn't change over time. This is not power-hungry authority. This is not abusive authority. This is the authority of a perfect, loving, heavenly Father. This is the divinely empowered authority of the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is how things really are. And this is who has authority. And as Jesus tells the next parable, we learn that this is the kind of authority that outlasts every one of our attempts to try to get rid of it. This is an interesting place for Jesus to go, but here we are. Chapter 21, beginning in verse 33, the second parable. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went away to another country. When the season for fruit drew near, there's that issue again, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. They think this is going to give everything to them. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? So Jesus tells a story, and then he turns to the Sanhedrin again and asks them this question. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the Scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. 
And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. <laughs> they got it. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Here another parable. Jesus says, let's talk about this from another point of view. He talks about a master, a vineyard, tenants, servants, and a son. And the key to understanding this parable is that every one of those components stands for God's relationship with his people. God is the master. The vineyard is the way in which God has set things up so that we can produce fruit and be in right relationship with him. The tenants are essentially us, sinful people. His servants are those that he sends to remind us of the will and the authority of the master. And finally, the son himself is sent to remind us of who God is. Now, when Jesus tells this parable, he actually draws on something that they know, a rather dramatic passage of Scripture out of another one of their prophets. It's in the book of Isaiah, the first seven verses. And as we think about this, I actually want to read the first two verses of this parable in the, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. Listen to Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 2. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded weeds or wild grapes. Here's, what Jesus, here's how Jesus begins the parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenant. And when the time for fruit came, he came looking for fruit. The point of both of these is that God has actually arranged things so that his people can live flourishing and fruitful lives in him. That's incredible that God has put things together in this world, in our relationships, in our relationship with him on every conceivable level. God has created a vineyard and he's planted it and he's put us there so that we might flourish in relationship with him, produce fruit for him in our lives, good fruit in our lives for him. So when it comes time to look for that fruit, the master comes. God comes looking for his fruit. He's got arranges for flourishing and fruitful life with him. People reject it. We in our sin, we in our self-centeredness, we in everything that is broken about us, we reject what God has done for us. We reject where he has planted us. So what God does is he sends reminders. He sends his prophets. He sends his apostles. He gives us his word. He sends us to reminders about his authority and how he's planted us and what bearing fruit really looks like. What we do is what the tenants did, right? And in our sin, we reject the reminders. And in the Old Testament, they did. They got rid of prophets. They stoned prophets. They tried to kill prophets. They forgot to listen to. They failed. They refused to listen to it. People reject God's reminders. They would rather stay in their self-approved ways of life. They reject his authority. So God sends his son, and the image is as powerfully ironic as it can possibly be. Jesus is standing there having this conversation with the men who are plotting to kill him. He says, God sent his son. The master sends his son, and the tenants kill him. So he asks them, what should happen to those men who kill the son of the master? And they say in a moment of profound self-condemnation, those wretches need to come to a wretched end and that vineyard given to somebody else. Jesus essentially says, you have no idea how right you are. This is what God will do. Have you never read the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. They rejected Christ. They rejected Jesus as their Savior, as the Messiah, who was prophesied who would come. But that is not the end of the story. All of the times and all of the ways 
in which human beings inside of their own hearts with whatever kind of wherewithal they have inside of them to reject and get rid of Jesus Christ, that's not the end of the story. The kind of power that some individual wield, some individuals wield, especially in our history in communist and tyrannical regimes, doing everything they can, killing millions of people to get rid of Jesus Christ, is not the end of the story. It does not matter how many people reject this stone. God makes him the cornerstone. This is what God's authority is like no matter what we do to it. And he tells these men, God will make his life available to anyone who, to anyone who responds. He will give this fruitful life to anyone, right? Who will respond and bear fruit, no matter how many humans try to rid themselves of God. Friends, God will make Jesus, has made Jesus, the centerpiece of our salvation and relationship with him. It's just the way that it is. This is how his authority works. The passage of Scripture that Jesus quotes is actually all about our salvation and even rejoicing in our salvation. So I want to read a couple of extra verses. It comes from Psalm 118. <clears throat> and in Psalm 118... Beginning in verse 21, here's what Jesus draws from. Listen to this. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become this cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you. I thank you. You have made your son my salvation. No matter what else happens, this is the Lord's doing. And I will rejoice in it. Isn't that incredible? We encounter the authority of God to save our lives, to change and transform lives through our repentance and turning to him. And through our obedience and the life of actually bearing fruit, we come in contact with this thing that we should rejoice over day after day after day. So friends, it's really, really good news that God's authority is an authority of power. There's nothing a set of human beings can ever do that will rid him of the power to do what he wants to do. It's an authority of power. It's an authority of truth. It doesn't matter what anybody says. This is the way things really are. It's an authority of wisdom. This is how life really is best lived. He plants us in this fertile soil, and he makes it possible for us to flourish in him and bear fruit. You guys, this is incredible to me, especially given this context. This is an authority of love. God arranges for fruitful lives, and even when we reject him, he sends reminders and he sends his son, Jesus Christ. This is an authority of love. And despite all attempts to eliminate Jesus Christ, he remains the center of it all. You see, friends, in Jesus, there is life. In our turning, in our repenting, in our changing our minds, in our falling upon the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, there is the changing of hearts and minds of, and lives and brand new way of living in Jesus Christ, in his mercy, in his love. Let's pray.